bad video games, government conspiracies, alien invasions, women revealed to be fake gamers? Angry Video Game Nerd The Movie is a film that has everything. But at what cost? In April of 2012, a lifelong fan of cinema finally got to direct his feature film, based on the beloved web series. He uprooted his life to move to LA, put his YouTube show on hold, and made a high-concept action-adventure comedy road trip movie in the style of 1980s genre films. He would co-direct, co-write, edit, and star in the film. And the result is certainly a movie. Welcome to the computer lab, Will. Welcome back from your, your sick leave. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't too long a, a sick leave, but, you know, it could be noticeable on the podcast or maybe not. But, yeah. You were good. dearly missed. So yeah. Glad to be back. Um, our whole friendship has led up to this review. Us <laughs> co-reviewing a movie. Mm. I, I don't have a structure for this one. This will be a true 50-50 episode, I think. <laughs> um, I know what I think, but in the sort of Siskel and Ebert style. How about you go first and tell us, how would you describe it? And then what do you, what did you think? <laughs> how would I describe it? Um, it's a very kind of confused movie that seems... Um, reading some of the other reviews I saw on Letterboxd, like people were talking about it didn't feel like an AVGN movie because it felt more like a James Rolfe movie in that mm. a lot of the a lot of the film felt like it wasn't bouncing off his character quite as much as it could be since it's sure, ostensibly yeah. the angry video game nerd movie. Yeah. But heck, I mean, to me, that's the least of its problems. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I would was, agree. Yeah. I was so preoccupied with just how how messy the <laughs> the plot was and just yeah. how confused everything about the production was. Yeah. It, it still comes from like a, you know, very messy heart, but good God, is it a mess, I'll say. Well, I think you and I both love movies that are kind of weird adaptations of a thing where it's very loose, right? Mm -hmm. Like I would think of Miami Vice. It's not like the most one-to-one -one adaptation. And we've seen things where web shows become cable shows or things like that. We've both seen things change a lot. So I don't think we really care about that too much. Or we knew that going in. This won't literally be a 90-minute review. Right? Fair enough, yeah. I mean, as far as Anne anime goes i'm you know i'm pretty open when it comes to liberal adaptations and mm -hmm. uh you know sometimes like i don't think if it's like a live action adaptation or something i don't think these things need to be one-to-one -one per se um sure yeah because it always opens the possibility for something to be better if there's things that can be improved for the better well i think kind of to your point there's I'll have to track down which video this was, but I remember when James Rolfe was kind of soft pitching the movie to the fans years before the Kickstarter, or at least months before, he sort of referred to it, as, he used Rocky as the comparison. And people mm -hmm. were asking like, what's the AVGN movie going to look like? And he said, it won't just be a 90 minute game review. Rocky is not just a 90 minute boxing match, mm -hmm. right? It leads up to it into a thing. Yes, there is a game review in it, but you see, it's a movie about game reviewing very much in the way that Rocky is a movie about boxing. But the whole movie's not a boxing match. It's about the character. Which is an interesting comparison in the sense that they're both from Philadelphia and that's where the comparison kind of ends because <laughs> realistically, I mean, we're going to talk about a lot of other movies just to kind of give context for what is happening in the AVGN movie. Mm -hmm. A sports movie, I'm not going to say it's easy to write, but a lot of questions, dramatic tension is sort of resolved for you as a writer. Mm -hmm. A sporting match has a one winner and one loser, right? Oddly enough, in Rocky, there's a draw at the end. But you feel mm. like he wins enough, right? Yeah. By the end of Rocky, it's like there's a clear winner and Apollo sort of loses, or at least he loses his credibility. Mm -hmm. If it's a boxing match, you have a training montage. It's a guy running and punching meat. Like, Rocky's a cool-ass movie to watch because everything's so visual. How do you dramatize a video game review is a question. But also, and I think this is kind of more of the problem, is that other people have tried and failed to transition from a direct address to camera like hey everyone this is my show like sort of uh, type of comedy to dramatic narrative scene work with dialogue not a lot of people have done that well john stewart who was very talented he directed a movie that was trying to take his daily show satire and make it a drama critics hated it mm -hmm. which is of course uh, irresistible with steve carell from a couple years ago mm. i guess what i'm saying with all this it's not easy to transition from i'm going to talk to the camera and deliver jokes you're in this weird vacuum where you're just directly addressing the audience and like how do you take that and put it into what is essentially a situation comedy it's two characters mm -hmm. fictional conceits describing things and tensions within the scene that's a question. Not a lot of people have done it well. This movie, the Angry Video Game Nerd movie, really does not make that leap. And I think you you called that out early. I, it mm -hmm. took me a while to realize that's what was happening. Mm -hmm. I, I think you got that from the trailer. Honestly, it was more prevalent in the trailer because I could mm. feel the way 
you know, they were doing sort of the montage of like obviously clipping together just like a small selection of scenes. It felt like from what was in that trailer, everything was James in his kind of performative mode, like looking to the camera like, oh, this is like all this kind of contained bit. But yeah. there's like this dramatic nucleus that's around and everything. And it just like doesn't really bounce off that. So it feels like he's existing in like a completely different movie from everything else. And it's like, you know, it almost feels like he's stopping for a reaction or like yeah it, it feels like kind of a studio comedy almost like oh here's here's where i do the reaction and it's like oh and you're he's like waiting and it doesn't feel like an organic rhythm as far as like structured storytelling so much yeah. as like yeah kind of like comedic skit and like here's kind of the bits and pieces and all that so yeah just like going off that trailer i was like there is something really uncanny about this like it it doesn't really co- like mesh well and it's very strange but then like mm-hmm. By the time I saw like the movie in whole in earnest, I was like, that was the least of my concern. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was something. Well, oddly enough, you mentioned reading letterboxed reviews. Mm-hmm. I've for our previous episode on James Rolfe and the DVX one hundred, I sort of looked up a lot of writing about James Rolfe and about the movie. I, I watched some pretty in depth criticism of kind of his web series over the years and what's happened, especially with the some of the scandals that happened with plagiarism. The thing is, all these people who are willing to do really in depth research on what happened with Cinemassacre, or what happened with James Rolfe. I saw an alarming amount of people who were like, I could not sit through the movie. I tried research wise. I could not sit through this movie. And I think we'll get more into that. Like what makes a movie hard to watch? Mm-hmm. Cause it's not just like this thing's so bad. I can't watch it. Right. It's yeah. things can be bad and very watchable, mm-hmm. but it's a lot to do with a lack of dramatic tension, lack of celebrities. You know, of course we're going to keep coming back to this question. How do you take a skit essentially and move it into long form? I'm going to read you a little bit of my own paragraph. Cause I wanted to really get these words right. Just okay. to really, I'll say this, the AVGN movie, as I see it is actually, more in conversation with movies based on comedy sketches like Night of the Roxbury, It's Pat, or The Blues Brothers. Um, obviously, It's Pat is not very well liked. A lot of SNL movies are not well liked. We just tend to remember you know, uh, the Wayne's World. But I'd like to point out that these movies take the characters at face value, so that the characters are what they are, and they slap a kind of idiot-proof premise on top of it. We gotta find enough money to save the orphanage. So that's Blues Brothers. And then while the AVGN movie does attempt to be an action comedy adventure road movie, the stakes are incredibly internal. If he fails and the E.T. sequel game comes out, he just kind of gets bummed out. <laughs> like, I don't really know what's going on there. So it's, it's, it's less to do with the Rocky thing. And it's more like, how do you take a sketch and make that long form? And he tries to put a plot on it. And I think he puts like seven or eight plots on it. <laughs> if you ask me, I don't know what yeah. you think of that. That's just it. Because I, um, you were kind of touching on what I was thinking. Like the stakes feel very intangible and mm-hmm. kind of the defining parties and like tone of what it's going for. Just like, it's very erratic. It has like a kind of poor grasp on like keeping the character threads like in line and everyone together and everything organically motivated from one thing mm-hmm. to the next. Everything feels like it's like each act feels like it's heading into the third act before. Mm-hmm. And like it, it's hard to know what's entirely going on because it's like over plotted, but also like the motivations aren't quite clear because it's like probably the most coherent thing about it is like the opening expository bit about like the ET history history and everything oh okay with the landfills and all that it feels like it's leading into a normally structured movie yeah we started talking about the prologue i forgot that there's like seven prologues yeah (laughs) because i when you said prologue i started thinking about all the fan webcam videos and Mm -hmm. people saying i love avgm but there's one before that which is the et backstory so there's a lot of prologues first of all it starts off with like and i i wasn't even sure if like the movie was telling us because of how direct the opening exposition was like i thought it was taken as fact but Mm. like one of the concerns of the film is that this thing that is stated right from the onset is like something that is up for contention even though it it immediately leads into a scene where some game developers are like oh look at all this lore behind like the et game we're gonna make like the sequel to the shittiest game ever and it's gonna have like all this bad lore behind it and you mentioned how like these other movies like wayne's world you know they have these like central like idiot characters that yeah. like bounce off a very normal world and that's what creates like a lot of the like great comedy and everything is you have something to offset that um, yeah. there's like the people around the protagonists are mm-hmm. normal people yeah. in every sense of the word yeah. not the case in this movie yeah no because it's like the game company is called Cockburn Studios yeah. like it's very just indulgent and just all this like juvenilia and everything 
everything. It's yeah. like everything about the world is also trying to kind of be AVGN like. And yes. so that's what makes it like very kind of awkward. It would be better if like everything else that's normal that he like created this persona, like getting away from bounces off of and everything rather yeah. than it's like, oh, here's shit fart McGee and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's not even quite at the level of absurdism that you can kind of get away with that either. Like the plotting is just very cumbersome. So it, it feels like a chore to watch. I'm glad you mentioned Cockburn Industries because mm-hmm. I almost, and I'm not like an expert on explaining jokes, yeah. but I will try. Like Cockburn doesn't give him anything to work with because James Rolfe's whole thing is he's reacting to weird images in video games and especially mm-hmm. the NES stuff. It's very, it's actually very daily show. It'll show you a clip of the game. The, it glitches out in a weird way and then it cuts to James going, <laughs> or he yeah. just like looks angry and then he says a thing. The thing is, Cockburn, like, what if it was, and I'm going to make up a joke on the spot, it's not going to be funny. What if it was called, like, Rod Burn or Stick Burn, and then that gives him a chance to do the joke, which is Stick Burn, more like Dick Burn, right? Like, Mm -hmm. AVGN's whole modus is that he looks at a thing that's sort of verging on being inappropriate because someone just used language weirdly, Mm -hmm. or it's mistranslated or whatever, and then he takes it to the next level by escalating it. But, yeah, as you say, like, when it's already Cockburn Industries... There's no joke to be made. It's already mm. ridiculous. It's got like the Angry Birds bird on yeah, it. Yeah. I'm like, you've already, like, this is a world loaded up with jokes. So, what does James Rolfe do? It almost feels like he should kind of Blues Brothers ish, like mm-hmm. when they go in the orphanage. It's like, why can't it be James Rolfe interacting with a bunch of suits? Like, what if he's like right. getting sued and it turns into a social network? I'm pitching a very bad movie right now. I realize <laughs> that would not be a good movie, but I'm kind of, I guess I'm trying to illustrate like why this doesn't work. Right. I do want to say it's a kind of a road trip movie in the sense that he starts in. I guess Philadelphia. I'm actually not mm-hmm. sure. It starts in a suburb somewhere. Yeah. And then they go to Las Vegas to go find the thing. Mm-hmm. The thing is, a lot of road trip movies are different from adventure kind of high concept movies because in a road trip movie, traditionally, the story kind of ends when they get there, mm-hmm. right? Uh, in this movie, that's not the case. They get there after like a 10-minute montage. And there's this weird montage where it's showing like the, the signs of different states, like mm-hmm. Welcome to Florida. And it's just them loading up more video game gear into the truck. And I don't know why they're loading video game gear into the truck. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense to me. I forgot about that. And so it's like, why is there a road trip? There's, nothing happens on the road. Yeah, <laughs> like, no. She takes a call sneakily while they're asleep. That doesn't yeah. really turn into anything. Usually when someone's like secretly taking a call, another character will hear it and mm-hmm. suspect something and then there's drama. Yeah. That doesn't happen. Yeah, like no. there's a lot of threads in this movie that don't go anywhere and there's just so many threads. Mm-hmm. So the, the road trip, it's not functioning as a road trip because the story, once they reach their destination, the story keeps going. Like famously like National Lampoon's Vacation, they go to Wally World, mm-hmm. they get there, the movie ends. And yeah. that's kind of the structure. Mm-hmm. Like one of my major things um, is that, oh, I forget the... The female character's name, like... I have also forgotten. Yeah, but... Unremarkable. Yeah, like, her thread, I think, is, like, one of the most emblematic of, like, the movie's failings. And as you were saying, it doesn't go anywhere because it's, like, the opening exposition leads into this, like, corporate meeting and she's trying to, like, pitch this thing. It's like, oh, we're gonna convince James Rolfe to, like, promote our new game. And it's framed in, like, an an almost sinister way. And there's all these, like, illusions over the course of the film. Like, she's being secretive and blah, blah, Mm. blah. And you think, like, it's going to lead somewhere. At one point, she gets kidnapped by, like, the government or the military guys. I hate that sentence. (laughs) She gets kidnapped by the government. government. Because we could not follow this movie. Yeah, it's it's so so much. James and his uh, cohort are, like, suspecting she's, like, a double agent because for some other reasons, they were kind of privy to her being suspicious, but they didn't. They were asleep when she was making like the shady phone call and doing all this other stuff. But it's like we as an audience, like we already know. And, you know, it's kind of the point of dramatic irony, I guess. But it's like it didn't really manifest here because it's like, oh, it's building up like, oh, she's kind of shady. And maybe there's more to her than we know. And like she starts out, it seems like she's trying to weasel her way into the Mm AVGN thing. And she's going to be like a main antagonist. And there's like this whole big thing. But no, she gets like eclipsed by a, like the other like actual villains pretty early on and then her thread is like well avgen and like his cohort are like oh she might be a double agent as far as the grand plot oh we're not going to chase after her cuz she's probably off doing 
some shady shit. So, oh, she just yeah, disappears, and it's she, like, who cares? She, yeah, her thread goes completely in this other direction, and she get she gets kidnapped. So they just don't care because they think she's fishy. Yeah, and so the military guys are like trying to threaten her, like, oh, reveal the location of like the scientist we exiled at some point. But they don't credibly like threaten her. They like yeah. there's nothing at stake. It's like, oh, you're you're gonna tell us where he is, and they're like, <laughs> it's, <finger> away. <laughs> it's like you better do it. Yeah. Like they don't torture or anything. Like they have guns. They're like, oh, you better. But the military guy's like, oh, you can't kill her because then we will lose the secret. It's like, well, yeah. you have to like extort her somehow or you're not like gaining any momentum in this like exchange of information. And she literally just leads them away to the Eiffel Tower in Las Vegas arbitrarily. And it's like, yeah. oh yeah, I think he's around here. And like, it just goes nowhere. And then yep. she gets tied up by the female big bad at one point and then oh that was the worst and that then, scene was awful yeah and then it was just like she's tied up and like they're i don't even think they try to like threaten uh james with her as like a hostage or right, something yeah. it, and at some point she's like oh i bet you can't like beat me in a fight and she just unties her, her and they they just fight it's yeah. like she she liberated herself in the most like half-assed way. It's yeah. like, you know, it's fine for female agency. Like she gets to do her own thing without like James and the other guy like coming in to sure, like yeah. save her. Like, sure. But also like it's incredibly dumb. <laughs> like yeah. there's there's no there's nothing like providing any like palpable urgency to like anything to do with that and it's it becomes yeah. like so far removed from the rest of the movie for so long it, it bugs it's, the crap out of me yeah i mean there's so much we could say the little nitty-gritty of why this movie's not working but like you know with the torture stuff or like the kidnapping nothing's happening that we care about and i'm not saying i want like images of people being tortured but if the movie yeah. must include that it should probably be that like you know fake seek double agent person character torturing james or mm -hmm. something like that yeah. like something that in some way impacts either the protagonist or the plot mm -hmm. ideally both but in this case it's neither yeah <laughs> um so that's a whole thing mm -hmm. and, and again the movies that are influencing james are a lot of like post cold war era like reagan era americana movies mm -hmm. where it's like the villains are Russian and you're in Russia in a, in a mass market blockbuster movie. You want everything to be readily identifiable. A fifth grader could watch this and understand. So the bad guys have weird accents, usually Eastern European, mm -hmm. although in the 2000s we saw that just become vague, you know, brown or Middle Eastern people. Um, but at this time, it's like, you know, make a make a, a, an evil character who's Russian. And so when they have a weird accent, you know, in air quotes, or they're wearing scary clothes, we know they're the bad guy. And in this, it's like, as you say, there's the government, the military, there's like the people from Atari, there's the people who make the game, there's like the company that's making the secret. I'm like, what is like, there's so many forces of antagonism. And, and you know, these, these 80s movies that James Rolfe loves, like Ghostbusters or whatever, there's like a singular big bad at the end of it. Like mm -hmm. there's a bad guy. Yeah. And it's, you know, I, I think recently we're kind of post Seinfeld, post Breaking Bad, post mm -hmm. all these sort of like things in movies that make antagonism a bit more gray, shades mm -hmm. of gray you know, maybe we're all afraid to do like a bad guy. But the thing is, he's deliberately making like an 80s style movie. You can mm -hmm. have like a cartoon, like mustache twirling villain. That's sort of what this movie needs to have. Yeah. And there's just all this weird shit. It was so broad and confusing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's so many forces of antagonism that kind of don't do anything to James because you don't know what James wants. Yeah. For those who maybe haven't seen the movie, like he works at a game store and he has a very successful online review show, which is confusing because his show seems to be popular enough that it's caught the attention of corporate America and everyone recognizes him on the street, which begs the question, why is he also working at GameStop? Yeah. Yeah. But either way, he's working at GameStop. He's also surprised when a display appears in GameStop. Mm -hmm. Dude, you work there. <laughs> you would have set it up. Like, yeah. A lot of screenwriting problems right from the get go. Mm -hmm. Like, why is the manager of the store setting up in store displays? That's like mm -hmm. grunt work. Yeah. Anyway, the, even explaining the premise irritates me. But he, they're trying to set up this thing that he's got this sort of internal conflict where he likes going online. The character, the nerd character, mm -hmm. likes going online and making reviews uh, to yell at games, but he really hates those games. And yet people watching his reviews buy the games because his reviews are funny. And for some reason he feels really bad about it. He's like annoyed mm -hmm. that people buy these bad games because it, question mark like it, it makes him annoyed that yeah. his reviews are having this effect the film sets that up as like his internal character arc and then it drops it right away yeah <laughs> i don't know where to go i don't know what you thought of that but. yeah because it's like 
like the earliest um, bits of like the Cockburn Industries and everything. It's like, oh, they're trying to push like their marketing and they want to make this game and like promote this game and like get James to like sign off on this. And Mm -hmm. he's trying to get away from like all this like, you know, irony poisoned. Like he's trying to say these games are bad. Don't play them. And but like people take the opposite approach and are like, oh, it's so funny, blah, blah, blah. Kind of the call to action is like just very arbitrary because like a bunch of people walk into like game cops. Good lord! Okay, yeah, yeah, the, like the flash mob in his store. Yeah, 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 it's a literal flash mob going e t e t. Like they want to see a review, and he's like, "Oh my god! Like this is the worst thing ever." So. Like, that's what spurs him to be like, okay, I have to go to, like, Nevada to uncover, yeah. a debunk a giant myth by excavating a bunch of games. Yeah. And, like, it, it's just, like, you know, yeah. there's nothing really, like, propulsive there. And, like, it's his internal motivations seem confused and, like, the lore of the movie seems confused. And it's yeah. just, like... And then that spins off to, like... I don't even know what like the military wanted. They they like are harboring an alien as like a secret, but they also maybe want world domination because they blow up Mount Fuji at one point and then <laughs> unleashes like a giant mecha monster and that created the world or something. Yeah, yeah. and and that ties into some really stupid non sequitur about like it's meant to be like foreshadowing, but it's yeah. like incredibly awkward because it's like you're seeing James's like cohort character. He just goes on about all these conspiracy theories out of yep. nowhere and it's like, why are you doing this? It's just yeah. and then it's like, oh hey, th- th- we we pre established that there's like this extreme being and blah blah blah. And it like the joke feels like so poorly timed like his yeah. whole explanation this yeah. weird information dump and it everything feels like so forced and inorganic and well they're trying to bury exposition in this joke that they're just like filming a mm-hmm. bit about the nevada desert and then out of nowhere he's like santa claus isn't real and then the guy filming is like yes he is and like <laughs> then they go into this thing about the earth being flat and then they start talking about a beast hiding under mount fuji yeah here's the thing because i'm also i'm gonna hold james accountable for the movies he's inspired by because mm-hmm. he's very clear about his influences yeah. he loves back to the future and ghostbusters I love one of those movies and I don't love the other, but either way, they're both great at burying exposition. I mean, back to the future is a masterclass in just like getting a bunch of exposition out of the way. Half of the movies exposition and the other half of the movies like paying that off. And it all kind of feels organic. Like everything that they're setting up, like they don't have like a sit down scene where someone's like, did you know Biff has been bullying your dad for 40 years? It's <laughs> like Biff shows up like in his house already. The car is totaled. Like it's all so visual. Mm-hmm. And again, that movie's incredibly well made, but like, yeah, their, their way of setting up this like third act alien thing is to just like completely stop a scene in its tracks, like mm-hmm. dead in its tracks, <laughs> go to this complete, as you say, non sequitur a completely other story about an alien under Mount Fuji. Mm-hmm. And I could picture like James sitting at final draft being like, okay, they're talking about the Nevada desert. How do I make this about Mount Fuji? Like not an easy leap to make. Mm-mm. I don't know what I would have done different, but it's not done well here. <laughs> yeah, no, like it, this just needed like several more passes. I think like yeah. it's probably salvageable, I'm sure, but it's just like, there's way too much going on and yeah. like, yeah, just because of the kind of act structure and like the problems with that I mentioned early on, like it's just a chore to sit through. I'm yeah. like, like half an hour in, I was like, oh, it feels like the movie's almost over and it's like, oh no, there's another like hour and a half to go. Yeah. And then after another half hour, I'm like, oh, is it almost over? And it's like, still got an hour to go. And I was like, oh, this is dreadful. Yeah. It's also not a 90 minute comedy. No. It's like a two hour genre movie. Mm-hmm. The thing is, Every, every time we mention this game, what's called Game Cop, but it's essentially GameStop. Yeah. I, I just can't get over it. I'm going to keep you know pounding this to the table. He is famous enough within the show to get recognized on the street, and yet he still has a day job. This bothers me so much. Like, Think of people who are internet famous. A lot of them can still go about their day-to-day lives without getting stopped at a random grocery store or like a supermarket, right? Yeah. James Rolfe, in real life and in the movie, is like A-list internet famous that he will get stopped in public. Problem with that is like if you're that famous, you have a revenue stream with your show, and that's like been codified over the last couple decades Mm. yeah in this movie he's like 
a celebrity and has no money. And they don't explain why that is. And I, that bothers me so much. And I can't articulate why. I'll compare it to something I like a lot that I think mm-hmm. we both like a lot. I'm not saying this show does it bad, but it gives me the same affect. And this is a bit of a tangent. But Larry David in Curb Your Enthusiasm is playing himself post Seinfeld. So he's got all the money from Seinfeld, Mm -hmm. but he's not playing the version of himself that is famous for being in Curb Your Enthusiasm. And the reason I find that weird is that he's instantly recognizable now. So people in Curb Your Enthusiasm are not like, hey, you're Larry David. A few people are and they're like, hey, you're the guy that made Seinfeld. But in the real world, because of the show that he's making, Mm -hmm. he becomes famous, gets cast in a Woody Allen movie. Everyone knows what he looks like. That friggin' whatever works poster is so (laughs) famous. Not a great movie and obviously Woody Allen's a whole thing. But that's the thing about Curb Your Enthusiasm that confuses me is like he's playing himself but not the version of himself that's in this show that we're watching. I know that's a weird line to be drawing yeah, but that weirds me out. It's like, you know, it had to be true at like maybe the inception of Curb Your Enthusiasm at mm-hmm. the time because it's like, oh, who's this Larry David guy? Oh, here's this weird old man. It's like, oh, that was the guy who made Seinfeld. Right. And then because of the sustained like length and time that Curb Your Enthusiasm has been on the air. It's like, oh, now like you have to suspend your disbelief and put yourself in a certain headspace. It's like, oh, there was a time where Larry David didn't have this iconography to him. Yeah. And it's like, oh, okay, we have to like go back to this very specific period. But also the show is like so popular and so well-received that it keeps like going and going. And now it's almost ending soon. Yeah. Um, it sort of enforces that logic upon himself. They, they set up in the beginning, this man is famous. I'm like, yeah. this breaks the rest of your movie. Like, mm-hmm. why not just make him not famous? Or why not Why not literally do the Rocky thing? This is like if Rocky opened, it's like the world's most famous boxer. It, let's watch him for two hours. Just yeah. keep trying to be the world's most famous boxer. <laughs> or like, watch him keep trying to say no to a fight. It's mm-hmm. like, there's no stakes. Like, yeah. if he's already that famous and successful, I'm upset. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> You know what might take us way off track, but I feel Mm. like we need to talk about because I have strong feelings about it. Okay. I don't know if we've ever talked about this before Mm. in all our years of cinema talk. Um, Practical versus digital effects. Mm. And specifically, I don't know if you're on my wavelength about this. We'll see how in sync we are. But the idea of James growing up watching a lot of ILM Lucasfilm stuff Mm -hmm. like, you know, Indiana Jones, Star Wars, a lot of those effects that are handmade in their original form. Mm -hmm. He doesn't love the look of CGI, right? As we had come to understand it with like, you know, Ant-Man 7, right? Everything CGI. So James Rolfe prefers the look of what are essentially puppets or stop motion or like matte paintings, Mm -hmm. things that are like practical effects, which is kind of a broad word that Mm -hmm. means basically what would have been in Star Wars in its original form. My concern is that when you try to make practical effects for the sake of practical effects, you're you're forcing a level of cuteness onto those effects that was not their intention. Mm-hmm. So like Disney Plus is an amazing documentary about the ILM workers making the effects of Star Wars and early Indiana Jones. They were not trying to be cute. You know, they were trying to make realistic looking images. And so when you go back to those tools, not with the intention of making realistic images, but the intention of let's do something cute and throwback and vintage... Mm-hmm you're already starting from a place of you're not being the same person they were. You're not seeking what your heroes saw. Mm -hmm. You're trying to mimic that. It's almost like when people do pixel art now Mm -hmm. and it's like sort of the individual sprites are pixelated, but the whole screen is like sparkling HD with particle effects and like (laughs) bloom and HDR. That's fair. And it's like, this doesn't look like any video game that has ever existed. You're putting too much mustard on it. Mm -hmm. Does any of this make sense? It's funny you say that because like, I know your whole thing is you, you are very anti nostalgia and (laughs) the the entire concept of it. So it's like taken quite literally like practical effects and these, analog effects it's like these guys as you were saying like these creators like they didn't have access to this technology Mm -hmm. so they're trying to like improvise and they're trying to simulate and uh, create that audience immersion when you think of like practical effects in a vacuum and that's your only way of seeing these things it obviously becomes uh, you know very limiting and it's like oh remember the good old days it's you know very retrograde and regressive or Um, just very stagnant. You're thinking like, I have all these things available to me that can make things more efficient, more believable, but I'm opting to go the hard way because of some arbitrary novelty for the sake of it. And so it's just like, what looks good looks good is kind of my philosophy. So it's like, I've always been a little wary of being completely beholden to practical. It's like, you know, AI is its own like scary thing and that, 
I think there's way more repercussions to AI than there is yeah. just like digital artistry. Because, you know, just forewarning, I like the prequels of Star Wars sure, more yeah. than the originals. It's like, you know, I respect the craft of how kind of underdog the original Star Wars was and the, like all the production labors and the highs and lows, such a roller coaster. And it's something mm-hmm. of a small miracle production wise and everything. If you compare like a cantina scene from like the original Star Wars to something like in the prequels, it's like in the originals, it's like most of the aliens are like covered in shadows. Like you can't yeah. make out like anything. It's always like some kind of approximation of a sense of wonder it's trying to instill, but it's never like kind of viscerally like like surprising and cool, I, f- I feel like mm. going into them myself. I'm just like, okay, like here's a, another shadowy figure. You like kind of, yeah. here's the silhouette of like some weird kind of alien shape. It's like, oh, cool, I guess. I can feel the hateful comments coming in. So I would like to bracket <laughs> this because I agree with you. Yeah. And I would like to bracket this by saying George Lucas was enormously unhappy with how the cantina scene turned out, mm. which is why in episode six with the opening Jabba's Palace, yeah. they went nuts. Like they oh, spent yeah. the whole budget, they brought back Jim Henson, it's Muppet City in there. Mm-hmm. He didn't feel that there was enough to look at. And to your point, like his unhappy happiness on set led to lighting decisions. Let's cover everything in shadows. I do not like how this looks. And of course, if you're a kid when those movies are coming out, for you, that's it's holistic. It's all one mm-hmm. thing, right? Yeah. I love how shadowy this scene is. It feels very grand and broad. Mm-hmm. That's not what the artist George Lucas was originally going for. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not saying you have to like, you know, go with what the author says yeah, about their own work. That's yeah. a, a fallacy, right? Mm-hmm. But I think that discrepancy needs to be acknowledged, mm-hmm. right? Like whatever it is that people like about Star Wars, and I think this isn't too controversial to say anymore, yeah. what Star Wars is and what people love about it is at odds with who George Lucas is and what he wanted Star Wars to be. Mm-hmm. And that's important to acknowledge, if nothing else, right? Yeah, absolutely. I kind of got into Star Wars, quote unquote, uh, pretty late and was yes, only like, yeah, only in my like early 20s was I like genuinely like trying to watch like all the movies and everything. Yeah, so there's no nostalgia for yeah, you, right? Yeah, not really. So um yeah, when I saw like the prequels and like I was giving them uh, like genuine watch as an adult, I'm like, you know, like a lot of this is digital and it's like but I'm not beholden to the idea like it's digital, therefore it's bad. And I'm like yeah. looking at how much work went into like all these designs, like all the worlds look like, you know, here's these like massive wide shots and like everything's so pastoral and like highly detailed. Like here's these like complexly rendered like citadels and everything. I'm like, this is like a lush world. Like it's yeah. so imaginative and beautiful. And look at something that can be created digitally with all this other effort, you know, that's not like practical but it it has its own sense of beauty to it and it's like that's the frame I'm seeing and that's the one I'm enjoying compared to like you know the cantina scene in like the original Star Wars New Hope or whatever so yeah I'm like I'm down for digital basically well I'm glad a little bit ago you mentioned AI Mm because I think uh, I type in a prompt, you know, cloud from Final Fantasy eating a giant apple or whatever, right? Like that is completely divorced from human artistry. The thing with CGI, and this has basically always been the case, maybe up till we'll see what happens with AI, but basically when he's making the prequels, George Lucas and, and his VFX team at ILM, it's all handmade. And there's this weird notion about CGI is that the computer does it, or it's like, there's, it's obviously got artifice as all effects do, mm-hmm. but that it's inhuman or it, it lacks a textural quality. That is such bullshit. And I'm trying not to like pound my fist when I say that Mm -hmm. because I I work in 3D modeling. I've done animation for corporate projects. Everything, you start with a cube, you extrude shapes. It's all handmade. And you're doing it with a mouse instead of with a a scalpel on like, you know, foam or whatever. I actually don't know how people make things physically. (laughs) But, right. um, And even like if you want to talk about photogrammetry where you're literally just scanning things into 3D, I mean, you look at Resident Evil 7 and 8, everything in those games, I don't know if absolutely everything, but most of what's in those games is a a 3D scan of a real object. So Mm -hmm. people still had to like make those real objects and then scan them. I guess what I want to impart to the viewer at home, and I know you know this, but I, I think this bears repeating, CGI is handmade. It is the labor of like thousands of artists like painstakingly drawing grain, like making little rocks that go in the background and I tell you, like when you're filling out the frame, it's the ultimate expression of mise-en-scene. Everything's there because you want it to be. And it's not like you just type in like, you know, a, a weird flying creature with long nose and then the, the computer gives you like 
what the hell am I think it's not Sebulba. What the hell is that guy's name? Yeah, oh, Wado. Sorry. Wado. Yeah. You know, it's not like the computer. You just type that in and the computer gives you Wado all rigged and like flying. Like it is all handmade. You know, they have to shoot reference footage with real guys. I mean, um, Ahmed Best, who does Jar Jar, like they found him doing Stomp in San Francisco, you know, mm-hmm. like with the, I don't know if you've seen Stomp, the movie where it's like they just run around and they jump on things and they'll like <laughs> dribble a basketball at the right moment or they'll clank like pots and pans together. Ah. You probably think I'm like having a fever dream right now. <laughs> anyway, it's this like, okay. it's like a live musical where they create the sounds by like stepping on things or mm. like causing impact, but it's not musical instruments. It's like pots and pans. Oh, okay. And anyway, very Foley like yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's very Foley. Nice. Yeah. Um, so he was doing that. So he's like a dancer. He's got like a performance background and you can see that with Jar Jar. I mean, motion capture, I think motion capture is really bad in the Marvel sense where they just find a famous person and get them to like say stuff. And it's like the most like uninteresting <laughs> performance. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, it comes down to casting and performance. Is this someone who's interesting to watch? And obviously I'm at best a very animated individual. He really like he moves. Right. Yeah. And I think that's why that character is so interesting. And it, it, over time we've seen motion capture used to like do really uninteresting or boring things. Mm-hmm. But at the heart of it, it's a tool that filmmakers can use to their benefit or not. Anyway, all of which to say, so this is my issue. This is the the tension I see with people who do practical effects for practical effects sake. And that's kind of what's going on in the AVGN movie is yeah. he's trying to return to form. And so I'll give you a few examples, but I do want to bracket this a little bit by saying that there are some artists who do practical effects who want it to seem fake. Mm-hmm. Um, oddly, we mentioned Star Wars where all that stuff's trying to look real with yeah. the exception notably that Jim Henson worked on all those movies doing like Yoda and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Jim Henson's whole philosophy on puppets is that this is supposed to look fake and that's part of the childhood like play of watching a movie. Mm-hmm. That's his own kind of theory, but generally that's not what George Lucas is going for with CGI. And anyway, so Angry Video Game Nerd movie, when he's doing these like practical effects shots, he's really going in with by presupposing that if we do this for real it's going to look real that might be true kind of but he's also faking it with miniatures and mm-hmm. so there's some shots where i don't know if you remember there's like a shot of a missile opening yeah like i remember what, exactly it it's yeah. clearly too small yeah like you can see the little grains of sand are mm-hmm. like he didn't find smaller sand it's mm-hmm. like normal sized sand so you can tell it's a small object mm-hmm. and the thing is a lot of these star wars miniatures that james rolf would have been inspired by Let's think of the Star Destroyer from the opening of A New Hope. Mm. It's like 20 feet long. Yeah. Like to call it a minute, it's not like the toy from Toys R Us, right? Mm-hmm. It's like this is a massive ass set and like yeah. like they rented out a whole warehouse to make it happen. Mm. They're also using lenses and lighting very specifically to achieve this sort of force perspective. These are experts. These are technicians. I believe the Battle of Hoth in episode five of Star Wars, mm. they actually used motorized camera rigs. What now we would call that a techno dolly, a very advanced feature. So all the camera moves are mechanized by a computer. Mm-hmm. You know, these were not like fussy old people saying, oh, we're going to shoot this like Gone with the Wind because we feel like it. It's Mm -hmm. like, no, they were trying to use the most advanced tech of their day to achieve that effect. And when you see the AVGN movie, a lot of these effect shots, you know, I do appreciate the thing with the large guy, as dumb as it is Mm story-wise, but the the large robot guy running around. Yeah. I guess that looks fine. But like some of the miniature shots are like when it's a vehicle, but it's clearly a toy car. Yeah. I know it's supposed to look fake, but it, it's not even endearing or interesting. It's mm-hmm. like even the angle is off. You're yeah. like, this is this isn't how you would have shot it if it was real. Which mm-hmm. is kind of the dead giveaway, right? Yeah. Anyway, I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but that's that bothered me a lot. <laughs> yeah, because I'm pretty sure there were still some digital effects here and there. And there's it, actually a lot of digital effects yeah, in the movie. Yeah. So yeah, there there's a lot of stuff that's still it feels like, you know, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but it seemed like you know, he was maybe going for like this kind of like very polished looking, like high production value. Like some of the effects mm-hmm. look really good and then others like look like painfully cheap. There's a there's a lot of abundance yeah, in quality. Exactly. So it's just like I don't know, just can like stick with a certain modality and yeah. like run with it because otherwise it's just going to leave this very like, like some of the uh, like on screen effects and like the computers and all that. They're, they'll have these like pretty elaborate and like convincing looking interfaces. Like mm-hmm. it's composited well, so it doesn't look like it's just like coming off the sides or anything. Like it's a pretty good job. Yeah. It, like some of it looks really convincing. And then you have the fight scene between like the women and then like the, the villain fall 
falls into like this like oh. shot of like the fountain and like it's clearly just like that shot was nuts. <laughs> yeah, and then she just like disappears at the end. They literally like you could tell they went on pond5.com, looked up <laughs> Las Vegas and just because yeah. the perspective does not match. No. Like it doesn't matter how good you do at keying the chroma and like, you know, rotoscoping the the thing to match it. Like all the skill set in the world, if the perspective doesn't match on the footage no. and the the plates you're done. Like yeah. it looks awful. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. So it's yeah. like, yeah, just, you know, stick with one or the other. And like, I think that extends to like the whole tonality of the film. It, it yeah. feels like it's trying to do like an earnest homage, but also like the spoof, but it doesn't really commit either way. And it yep. just gets way too over plotted and like boring and mostly too serious in the third act. And it's just like, ugh. yeah. And I think we've been relatively generous in terms of like the way the film looks. Mm. They shot this, uh, this next part's kind of weird to talk about because the fan reaction, I don't even I want to say fan in air quotes, but like because this was a kickstarted movie, you and I both know, but perhaps not everyone who helped kickstart this movie would know, and especially some of the people complaining about this movie online, that's not a lot of money if you're making certain kinds of movies. So that's that's an okay amount of money if you want to make two guys sitting in a room talking about Star Wars, which yep. is what Clerks is, right? <laughs> yeah. Um that money doesn't go far if you want to shoot in LA, which James Rolfe actually insisted on shooting this in LA, which was a horrible mistake. Mm -hmm. um, he's using all union cast and crew, and obviously we love unions, but the point of unions is to collectively bargain for the worker. Yeah. You don't go for union talent if you're looking to save a couple bucks. That's yeah. kind of the whole point of unions. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're getting skilled technicians, but it's going to cost you. And this is not a lot of money no. for an action adventure kind of movie. So we've been very kind toward the way this film looks, but... It's kind of this weird thing where there's a number of things in this movie where the tech isn't quite up to par for like, you know, a big budget Ridley Scott science fiction movie, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to read you a little bit. There's actually only three official critic reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. They're all positive. So technically, 100% on Rotten wow. Tomatoes. Wow. But it, it doesn't count if it's only three reviews. Yeah. Um, it's one review from Martin Liebman from Blu-ray.com, which mm -hmm. is a website that kind of just reports like, how is the Blu-ray mastered? Yeah. <laughs> They're kind of... <laughs> so I don't want to talk too much about the picture quality, but I think this review kind of sums it up. Mm -hmm. Angry Video Game Nerd, the movie, arrives on Blu-ray with an MPEG-2 1080p transfer that, don't forget, shares the same disc with hours upon hours of 720p bonus content. Combine that with the low-budget nature of the shoot, and it's no surprise that the movie never looks all that great. <laughs> Viewers will notice blocky artifacts, noise, and banding. I don't know if you remember the scene of him having the nightmare about the E.T. monster. Mm. It was clearly shot really underexposed, or they, oh, yeah. I think they shot this on a Panasonic camera of some sort. It clearly doesn't do great in low light, which is fine, but like, you know, night scenes and movies aren't actually low light. You blast the scene with light and then you like color it blue in post yeah. or you make it very directional light. So mm -hmm. like you have a, like a 20 K light source coming through the yeah. window on set. It looks bright as hell. And then in post, you make it look darker. Mm -hmm. The, I don't know if you know the scene I'm talking about where he has the nightmare. It looks like they actually shot in low light. And like mm -hmm. most cameras cannot do that. Sony can kind of do it now, but there's still a lot of compromises, but they're shooting on like what is basically a higher end camcorder. Anyway, that scene, I just wanted to be like, James, what are you doing? Like, this is like <laughs> film school one Oh one. Yeah. Don't actually shoot at night with no lights on. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? It's like so grainy and noisy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to complain about the look too much. Cause like, it is a low budget movie, but I'm like, dude, what the fuck? Like, it's, it's such an <laughs> obvious mistake. Yeah. Oh goodness. Anyway, that's a Blu-ray.com review. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, the fake ET game looks like Croc. Did you pick up on that at all? Uh, yeah, I was. I was okay. kind of thinking. I was like, oh, the way some of the environments are rendered, it was, and like some of the interface. I was like, this seems yeah. Croc-like. Yeah, yeah. Little gems when you walk yeah, around, yeah. even like the run animation. Yeah. Something to think about. Wild. I love that when it loads up the title screen, it's E.T. with like a mustache. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I don't know That's about a you. Good bit. Yeah, because it's like, oh, you you know, you're clearly trying to skirt around the copyright. Yeah. And it's like, oh, mustache. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's him disguised. Yeah. Oh, I love Beautiful. that. Yeah. That was funny. Oh, man. I guess I'll just list off some stuff that I liked about the movie because, yeah, you know, I think we're being generous, but to be honest about this movie, it's not very good and it's mm -hmm. hard to watch. Actually, let's talk about why it's hard to watch. Which, <laughs> yeah, okay. But yeah, a tremendous amount of people could not finish the movie. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a lot to do with like, you know, what makes a movie easy to watch? Like there are bad movies for sure, like The Room, which are just, mm -hmm. The Room is watchable because the central performance is a man who in real life is so strange and mm -hmm. so enigmatic. And it's also not, the room's not a low budget movie, which is also mm -hmm. kind of funny. Yeah. So it's like this very mysterious man. It's like it's like you're reading The Great Gatsby. You're mm -hmm. like, who is this mysterious man? But it's like if Gatsby made a movie. Yeah. You're like, who is this odd man with the strange mm -hmm. accent who's like lying about where he's from? 
Anyway, so some movies are fun to watch that are bad. This movie is it's like lowish budget. It's not that interesting visually. It's a lot of just people talking. Mm-hmm. There's no celebrities in it. The, the one guy, the friend character who works at the store with him, he was on the Bernie Mac show. Oh, okay. So there will be an awful lot of people who recognize him, but I think he was like famous when he was like seven mm. and now he's at whatever age he is in the movie. But there are a number of people who will recognize him, but yeah, not really any celebrities in the movie except for um, that one guy who like runs the store. He was like kind of recognizable. Oh, really? He's like a comedy actor. You huh. could tell some of the scenes of him where they're just like, hey, be funny for a minute. So there's like him on the phone being like, fuck, fuck, shit, fuck, fuck. Yeah. And it's like, you know, clearly like what an improv actor thinks is funny is just saying swear words over and over. <laughs> yeah. Ah, anyway, those are my feelings. Um, I think we're pretty much in agreement on this. <laughs> there were some jokes that made me laugh. I want a rock rolling or give me a rock rolling. Oh, yeah. And Maybe. Then he rolls. Yeah. <laughs> give me a rock rolling. That was, that was pretty cheeky. I that was, like that. That was cute. There's one like hippie character that says, and I, I just have this note. I don't mm-hmm. have context for it. I thought I found this bone in the woods, but it turned out to be wood. So you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> anyway, I don't know what it, it made me laugh. I thought it was kind of cute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, joke I liked. This might be a hot take. Joke I really liked. Come on. Do you have any idea where Area 51 is? Do you have any clue where Area 51 even is? Between Area 50 and 52? <laughs> I, li- I laughed. Yeah. <laughs> that made me laugh. And sometimes comedy is just silliness, right? Oh, yeah. And I think this film's so busy setting up eight different plots at once that there's not really time to be silly. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a shame. So anyway, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts, but yeah. Because we have our other episode where we kind of touched on AVGN and kind of, you know, the beauty of like when is like most absurd jokes like kind of pull off uh, mm. like the shit pickle and all these yeah. like kind of things. Yeah. So, you know, we certainly think, uh, you know, he's capable of obviously of being funny and of, yeah. you know, making yeah just fun, endearing things. But yeah, this was, you know, obviously something that, you know, it. it there was a lot of, you know, efforts and labors put into this and, you know, sometimes it just doesn't pan out. And, mm-hmm. you know, filmmaking is always like, you know, I think Paul Thomas Anderson said, like, uh, you should appreciate every movie because they all come from like these labors of love. They're all yeah. a small miracle and everything. Tons of hard work. Yeah. Um, I don't think that can be a complete absolute. There's there's <laughs> probably some, you yeah. know, very vile and very, you know, reprehensible stuff that gets to the final stages or whatever. Sure. And that's uh, very dicey. But, you know, for the most part, like a lot of people are, you know, trying their best and that sometimes that's all you can do. And you got to, you know, there's things that are, you can still appreciate about this movie and I got to give props to James for trying and all the same. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some people online, I, we'll just broadly call them the haters, right? People who think James Rolfe was scamming the fans with this movie mm-hmm. or like that he took the money and ran and he doesn't care and this was a low effort thing and that's just objectively not true. This was mm-hmm. a very high effort movie for him. You know, I've read his autobiography. He went into personal debt to make this. He uprooted his life, moved his wife, who I think they were about to have kids or something. Like they were in the early stages of like planning for a family. Mm-hmm. Like there was a lot going on with the making of this movie. Making a bad movie, and I'm not saying this is like a, a categorically bad movie, but mm-hmm. like making any kind of movie, including a bad one, is a lot of work. Yeah. And if he wanted to phone it in, I think we'd be able to tell. Oh, we went yeah. to film school. Yeah. We've seen movies where someone phoned it in, where mm-hmm. someone just like loops the same shots over and over, or like it's mostly B roll footage shot by a second unit. There is second unit footage in this, as mm-hmm. there is with any action movie. Yeah. But, you know, there's ways of copping out with a movie. And it seems like James Rolfe is, first of all, a very skilled and creative individual, but also put a lot of effort into this movie. And nonetheless, it's not great largely because of writing, mm-hmm. which it kind of is what it is. I don't think he's the most talented screenwriter. Mm-hmm. Um, the movies he looks up to are kind of hard to write. Back to the Future, it's a hard movie to write. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they did a lot of drafts of that. You have to cast very specific actors to deliver that sort of dialogue that's not just exposition, but it's like hiding exposition and a joke. Mm-hmm. That's not easy to write. I don't think he was up to the task. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. What James Rolfe did with the AVGN was really not only interesting for the time, but very high level, very skilled comedy for that sort of web format. When we were doing the last episode where we talked about the old nerd episodes, I was watching some and I didn't realize how much like, cause I started watching a shit in middle school. Like mm. that theme song, like I feel it in my bones. Like as soon as the <laughs> guitar, he's gonna tell I'm like, yeah, like <laughs> this is like the one time a week I'll hear a swear word in middle school. It's like I'm watching AVGN. I was like Beautiful. so excited <laughs> for the show to have that effect on me just in my bones. Like that's no small feat. There's very few things that cause that reaction in me. It's like, I'm not saying this is up there and with the same quality, but like the things that affect me on that level, like 
Star Wars, Calvin and Hobbes, like The Simpsons, mm. seasons three through nine. Like, and then AVGN is right up there somewhere <laughs> on that list. Beautiful. So I like him a lot. I'm rooting for James. I hope he tries again to make another movie. Yeah. Possibly a mumble core or a horror film or something, something a bit more realistic budget wise. Mm. You know, I think a lot of what makes James great as a filmmaker, at least with AVGN episodes, was his editing style. Mm-hmm. And I think there's more of an awareness now, but I think a lot of YouTubers that people like, it's their editing style in conjunction with their performance and writing that people love. So like Emma Chamberlain is, you know, very successful and popular on YouTube right now. She still edits her own stuff. And I think it's such a trap to be like, oh, I have money now. I'll hire an editor. Mm -hmm. The problem is it's not about skill level. It's about personality. And your editing is so much part of your comedic, I was going to say comedic joking, (laughs) comedic timing (laughs) and joke delivery. Yeah. And I really hope at the very least, I hope James Rolfe starts editing his own episodes again, because I think that's so much of where the comedy came from. Absolutely. Much has been said about how, you know, Mike Matei helped with the scripts and Mike Matei helped record gameplay. That's fine. You can outsource gameplay recording. I don't fucking care. If that's not you jumping in Super Mario, I don't give a fuck. But the editing is such a part. And I hope if he could just like slow down the releases, not make to a month or whatever and just make a few a year but like edit them himself really get his personality across i think that'd be a lot more fun anyway that was computer lab hijinks that was our review of (laughs) the angry no actually what's it called it's not the angry video game nerd movie i think it's angry angry video Video game nerd the movie okay angry video game nerd the movie it's on archive.org someone might take it down at one point but you can watch it for free there i'd recommend checking it out just for historical value go see some primo 2014 effects we still love you james we still love you james <laughs> please come be on the podcast we'll argue about practical effects <laughs> i'll open i'll open a blender and we'll argue for 10 hours <laughs> anyway all righty thanks for watching bye everyone Woo.